privilege to welcome you to our evening Christmas service. When you stand up the next time, if you just would, if there's any, if there's any uh, space in the middle of your row, if you would just squeeze in as best you can. We may yet have a few more people coming. We want to make sure that we're able to get everyone in. It's a joy to have everyone here. I'd like to read from Luke chapter 1, and this is Zachariah's praise as he considers the nature of, of his son, of the child that will go before the Messiah. Maybe I'll read from that. Luke chapter 1. Okay, it's okay. I I do do have it now, thank you. I do appreciate that. That was well done. I think if everyone would turn off their Bibles, we'd be fine. 
Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 27. To give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high will visit us, to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And we come to celebrate the one who came to shine the light, to guide our feet into the way of peace, apart from which there is no peace. And so we celebrate him tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the joy and privilege that it is to be together tonight, to be able to celebrate your birth, to be able to celebrate all that that, that means for us as you were born, as you walked upon this earth, as you lived a sinless life, as you ultimately went to the cross to take the wrath of God against our sins, to die in our place and to rise again, or to grant us new life, to ascend to be with the Father, to intercede for us, that we might be able to have a right relationship with you. And Lord, I pray that as we celebrate tonight, that truly you would be honored, that in everything we sing and everything that we say, that your name would be uplifted, that our hearts would be, would, would be, find greatest joy in magnifying you, and that it would be our great desire to shine the light to those around us, as well as to then take that light out and to shine it to a world that desperately needs to know of the light of Christ. In your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Uh, it, n now is the time when the Kingdom Kids Choir can go meet in the hallway, if you would. <coughs> Please stand.
take your seats. Thank you, Kingdom Kingdom Kid Choir and uh, Rachel Slate and Christy Stills. We're very grateful for the time you put into uh, helping them learn that. And it's just a joy to be here this evening. And I'm so grateful for uh, you being here. I'm grateful to celebrate 
uh, our Lord's arrival uh, of his first advent, uh, that is a time during the Christmas season where we celebrate his birth, but also in this, as we celebrate communion, really the climax and the reason why he came, and that is that he would come to die for sinners, that he would rise again, overcoming the penalty of death, and then of course, as we will see, we will be uh, celebrating this until he comes again. And so this is a great night, it's a great night of rejoicing, and I look forward to celebrating with you. Before we celebrate communion though, I'd like to look into God's word for just a few minutes, and if you would turn to John chapter 17, John chapter 17, and we're going to consider just a few verses, verses 20 through 23. And we would love to look at the whole prayer of Jesus, his high priestly prayer. But we're really going to look at what Jesus prayed and who he prayed for, for the, or, or why he prayed for those who would believe on the apostles' word. And so uh, we're going to read John 17, 20 through 23. And I want you to consider that the first six verses he has prayed for himself, ultimately, that he would be glorified, uh, that he'd be glorified with his Father, and then 6 through 19, he prays for his disciples, that uh, certain things about his disciples, that they uh, would have joy, that they would be sanctified in the truth, that they would be unified. But then he comes down to verse 20, and he prays for a certain group of people, and we're going to read that now. John 17, 20 through 23, I do not ask on behalf of these alone or the apostles, but for those also who believe in me through their or the apostles' word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Sorry, believe in you that sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you have loved me. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to gather together to celebrate this ongoing memorial of your death and burial and resurrection and all that that means. And Lord, I pray that as we look into your word that we would be encouraged this evening that as a church we would grow in this unity that you have prayed for. And I pray that Christians, Lord, throughout the world would rejoice in what you have done. And might we remember that you are at peace with those who believe on your Son. And so we pray that we would learn this evening, that we would grow, and in the end that we would grow in the unity that you have prayed for and continue to pray for. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, well, it is the night. The institution of the Lord's Supper happened on the night in which Christ was betrayed. And on that night, if you remember, um, Jesus, the Bible says, knew that his hour had come. And he would show his disciples several things. Number one, how to be a servant. He would also institute the Lord's Supper on that night as a seal of the new covenant. And then he, they would get up. Satan would enter Judas, actually beforehand, but Satan has entered Judas, and he has left, and the disciples and Jesus head for the Garden of Gethsemane. And on the way, he is talking to them about uh, I, things like, I am the vine and you are the branches. He promises, he, sent, he talks about the promise of the Holy Spirit that would come and guide them in all truth. But then he stops at some point in the hearing of the disciples, and he prays. And if the Lord's Prayer is a pattern for us to follow, this is a pouring out, this prayer, the high priestly prayer of Christ, a pouring out of his soul at the moment in which he is getting ready to give his life for sinners. And so that is what John 17 is ultimately about. And John 17 follows the Lord's Supper. And then when we see the Lord's Supper in Scripture, we often see a common theme of either division or unity. And so as we celebrate Christ's birth this evening, 
as well as his death, burial, and resurrection, and the fact that he is coming again, the purpose of this ultimately is not that we would grow in our faith, but also that we would grow in unity, not just as believers at large, if you are visiting from another church, but even more specifically here tonight, Grace Community Church, that we would grow together, and as we see this unfold, we will understand what that unity is, and I pray by the end of the night that we will rejoice uh, in the, the prayer of Christ and seek to even more grow in this unity that he prayed, uh, he poured his soul out for. Richard Phillips said of this prayer that Jesus first lays his hand on the people he would save and then lays his hand on God in praying on their behalf. First off, as I mentioned, that Christ prays for his glory, he prays for the disciples, but then he turns his prayer to those who would believe on him through their word. And there's a few things we need to know about just that statement alone. Number one, when Christ was going to cross, he had absolute confidence in the ones that he would die for. You don't see Jesus praying for those who might believe on him. You don't see Jesus praying in hopes that someone would believe on him. You see Jesus praying with confidence for those who would believe on him. If you turn back to John chapter 6, for just a moment, if you have your Bibles, if not, listen carefully. But John 6, 37, he said these words, All that the Father hath given me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Christ knew who he was dying for, and he was dying for a specific group of people. That is, those who would believe on him through the apostles' word. Well, that is the method or the means by which we are saved. That is, that we believe on the Son. And so Christ, in praying, gives the way in which sinners will be saved. We would behold the Son and we will believe on the Son. He mentions that back in John 17, he says... I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. And so Christ has absolute confidence, number one, that all that were given to him by the Father would come to him. By the way, if you read John chapter 10, he makes this statement, I have other sheep that are not of this fold, uh, stating very emphatically that those sheep are his in the future. They're already his ultimately. But then that they would believe on him so that his sheep, or those that he would die for, will believe on the Son. And the Bible says that whoever will believe on the Son will have life. Remember, probably the most famous verse if you're, uh, that you learned growing up, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. John 6.40 says, This is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes on him will have eternal life. We've just read that a moment ago. So the means by which sinners are saved are believing on the Son. But last in his statement, he says that those who will believe on him, that will come through the apostle's word. And so this is critical, because if you are saved here tonight, that is, you have placed your faith and trust in Christ alone for your salvation, you have repented you have, of your sin, and you have, uh, and, and as I mentioned, placed your faith in Christ alone. You heard that. That came down to you by the apostle's word, through the apostle's word. Somebody might have told you how to become a Christian, but they learned from somebody, from somebody, from somebody, ultimately, who communicated the word that came down from the apostles. And so Christ makes a very important statement right here in this verse, and he states this with confidence that I am going to die, I am going to die for those who, Father, you would give me. Now, that is important. That is not just something, he, he, he states this for a reason, because his very next phrase is going to show forth the unity that is in our salvation. 
Look what he says in verse 21. He says, and this is what he prays for, that is, for us here tonight, as well as for all believers down through the ages throughout time, that they may all be one. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. What does Christ pray for? He's going to the cross. In just a few moments, he's going to be pouring out his soul. He's going to be sweating, as it were, drops of blood. He's going he's gonna to realize that, or he, 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 he expresses that the Father's wrath, or he understands that the Father's wrath for the sin of those who he would die for, he will pay for. And yet, he prays for those who will believe on the word. What does he pray for? He prays for unity. That really shows forth how important Christ holds this. And even as we celebrate tonight communion, it is with remembrance that we are to grow in the unity that comes from Christ alone. This is important. It's not just something we come and do by ourselves, for ourselves. It is something that we do recognize, and yet it's something that as we partake this evening, it will be a remembrance that we are to be unified in the name of Christ. Now how? He says we are to be unified, and many have taken that and built their own unity down through time. And even in our own, in the last several years, you've heard of the ecumenical movement where a unity is trying to be built around things that, where, where they give up the essentials of the faith. And so, yeah, we, they want to grow in unity, and their heart might be in some senses right, but they don't unify around the essentials of what Christ is talking about here. And so they, they, they go astray. And any unity that is built around things that Christ is not talking about here will always lead astray. But he says we're to grow, we're, we're to be as one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. What exactly does Christ mean by this? And the fact of the matter is, these next couple of verses are difficult verses to really fully understand. In fact, we won't fully understand them tonight because it's beyond our understanding. It's simply just as the Trinity, the very Godhead, is beyond our understanding, we marvel at it, but yet we don't fully comprehend it, so is this unity that is expressed by Jesus that the Father and the Son and the Spirit have together. Yet what we do know is that this is a glorious unity, that the Son deeply desires this, and He desires this for all of those that he has set his, or that they have set their love upon. We get a, gri a, a glimpse of this, really, as some of the early church fathers expressed their understanding, or as best as they could understand, the Trinity. Listen to this. This is from Gregory of Nazianzus. He says, This I give to you to share and to defend all your life, the one Godhead and power found in the three in unit, and comprising the three separately, not unequal in substances or natures, neither increased nor diminished by superiorities nor inferiorities, in every respect equal, in every respect the same, just as the beauty and the greatness of the heavens is one, the infinite conjunction of the three infinite ones, each God when considered in himself as the Father, so the Son, as the Son, so the Spirit, the three one God when contemplated together, each God because consubstantial, one God because of the monarchia, no sooner, listen, if you didn't understand all that, join the club, but the fact of the matter is, I want you to, to grasp this next phrase, no sooner do I conceive of the one than I am illumined by the splendor of the three, no sooner do I distinguish them than I am carried back to the one. When I think of any one of the three, I think of him as the whole, and my eyes are filled, and the greater part of what I am thinking escapes me. I cannot grasp the greatness of that one so as to attribute a greater greatness to the rest. When I contemplate the three together, I see but one torch and cannot divide or measure out the undivided light. The glorious trinity. How do you really understand and comprehend all that the Trinity is and all that it means as they are unified three in one. We really cannot. However, we can marvel at it, and we can, there is something that we can understand, and that is that the Trinity, or the Father and the Son, uh, as Jesus has mentioned here, 
always work together. They are of the same mind, the same purpose. Jesus mentions this throughout uh, his time on earth. He says he always sought to do the Father's will. And there was never a time, never, where one of the Godhead did something apart from the total will of God. Never did they act on their own. And so we know that the Son always did what the Father told him. The Spirit, as Jesus said, will teach you what I tell him to ultimately. They are all content in their roles. They all work together for God's glory. Well, Jesus asked that we would be unified in purpose. There's a reason for that. As the church would spread, it would be easy for division to arise throughout the church. And so Jesus is praying that we would be one. And first, I just want to mention, that's not just one uh, here. That is one throughout the universal church. And that one, that unity is built around the essentials of the faith. First off, as you consider other believers throughout the world, all the believers down through time, we are unified around the essentials of the faith. The person and work of Christ, the Trinity has already been mentioned, the doctrine of justification by faith alone. We often talk about these things, the, the sufficiency and authority of Scripture. These are important things where we get, when we gather, we are unified together. If somebody were to walk in here, or if there is somebody in here tonight, and they deny that Jesus is fully God, fully man, we are not unified with them, and they are not unified with us. If somebody were to come in tonight and deny the Trinity, no matter how much they said about Christ, they would not believe in the Christ that, of the Bible. If somebody came in tonight and claimed that there was another way to be saved by belie than by believing on the Son we would not be unified. We often talk about the, the solas of the faith, and we have a conference each year where we try to understand and really get a greater grasp of these doctrines that are so important to our faith. There is a unity around the essentials of the faith, an important unity. And so believers worldwide are unified by the truth of Scripture and what the Scripture says. Yet Scripture talks about a unity in the local church. And so we're not going to spend a lot of time on the unity that is worldwide, on that unity that, that binds us as believers, the wonderful and sweet fellowship that we have uh, with believers everywhere. I rather just want to spend the last few minutes on the unity that is in the local church, or the unity that should be in a local church. When Christ was praying, he had already said earlier that he would build his church, and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. But the church was built through or by, the church was built with, in, with local churches in mind. We, tonight, the majority of us at Grace Community Church, work together as a local church. We worship the Lord as a local church here at Grace Community Church. If you are coming from another church, you are with a particular local church that you are serving with and seeking to glorify the Lord through. But the church is built through the local church. And the local church, throughout the scripture, it is important to understand that we, it is important that we understand the unity that needs to be built in the local church. And so if it would be pointless to talk this evening about unity and not talk about us here. In just a moment, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We're going to do that together. We're going to do that as one body, ultimately. And how horrible and what a reproach it would be on the very prayer of Christ that we would come to this table not unified. And so I want to, as we talk over the next few minutes, just mention a few things that would keep us from being unified here this evening. Now every church, and as you see this through scripture, every church has its own specific issues, its own specific things that, create, that were problems within that particular church. There were also commendations for each local church. And so the Lord does indeed look to the local church. We see this in Revelation, where he walks amongst the churches. And he mentions specific churches. But what about here? What are some things that could hinder or destroy unity here? We have our own unique set of challenges. And so there will be things here that may not be as much of an issue somewhere else. But the point of the matter is, is when we come here this evening, 
that we would glorify Christ. And any disunity would not bring him glory. However, unity, not uniformity, not that we all look exactly alike. Uniformity means you're identical. No, unity, that we're all of the same mind, all working for the glory of Christ, all desirous to see him glorified in this church. That's what we are continuing to work for. Well, number one, let me just mention, what could divide or what could break the unity of a church such as ours? It could be somebody who is seeking their own glory, ultimately. In other words, a teacher or an elder or someone that's leading a ministry that would desire to pull a following or to gain a following or to split, to, to drive home a teaching that would separate the body of Christ. This is something that the church is always having to work for and to work hard for. But any leader within a church has to be careful not to do this. And it's always as elders, we work hard at being unified. Because if the elders are not unified at a church, then the church itself will not bring glory to Christ in being unified. And so elders, Sunday school teachers, any leader ultimately must be careful to never seek to separate the church body. This can be done, by the way, through good things, good teaching. Churches have been split over parenting models, over eschatology. They've been split over all sorts of things. But if somebody comes that, that are good and it should be studied and it should be preached. But there are things when a teacher comes in and seeks to divide the body out of his own desire to push an agenda. And it's not good. And it can bring, a la it can dis can, it can create a lack of unity within a church body. Remember Diotrephes, who always sought to be first among the brethren. That is why a novice ultimately is not to be an elder, because oftentimes he seeks to bring, he, 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 he seeks to teach what he wants to teach and not come under, uh, and not recognize the love that should be in the body and a, 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 the unity that should be there as he teaches. Number two, it could be a lack of contentment. Oftentimes within churches, a contentment wanes. Oftentimes when you get to a church right off the bat, everything seems great. But over time, you begin to see the flaws. You begin to see things that you don't like. And so you can become discontented. You can become discontented, and we're talking about things that are not essentials. But you can become discontented with style, the style of the service. You can be discontented with the leadership. You can be discontented with um, you can be discontented with children's ministry, youth ministry, all sorts of different things that we can find to be discontented with. And when that discontent begins to spread, it can create disunity in the body of Christ. And if that's happening, and if that, can, if that happens at a particular church, that does not bring glory to the Lord. It can be a lack of commitment. Oftentimes we don't think of a lack of commitment as something that divides the body of Christ. But a lack of commitment, undervaluing Christ in his church, an unwillingness to follow the New Testament model and to be joined with a church, that is, to commit yourself to a particular body, an unwillingness to practice the one another's for the building up of the body of Christ, wherever this shows up in a particular person, it begins to separate out and bring disunity to a church. Bitterness is another one where relationships, for whatever reason, can create disunity within the church. And any given issue can create bitterness. Now, there are other things, and we could go on and on. But the fact of the matter is, is there are things that are very real that can create and can harm this body in particular. And if, it, if those things were to continue, or if those things were to, uh, if those things are alive, or if the elders are disunified, it can create serious harm. And that's why Jesus, when he prays, he prays for unity. Satan seeks to divide. That's what he does. He seeks to divide the body of Christ. But the church presses on as, he, as, they, as she focuses on Christ and seeks to be unified. As we come to the table this evening... I want to encourage us, whatever it might be. The Bible says to examine yourself. I don't know your heart. You don't know my heart. 
But what we do know is that the Bible says that we are to be of the same mind. That we are to glorify Christ by being unified together, not where we're all exactly alike, but where we are seeking to glorify Christ together, seeking to bring him honor and glory. That is the heart that drives a church that honors Christ. And when you consider that at, at the moment that Christ is going to the cross, that this is on his mind, it brings to light what we are doing here this evening. We are celebrating an event that happened just before he prays for this unity. And I want to encourage us this evening. Every church, no church, is perfect. But we ought to be growing in the unity that glorifies Christ. And whatever it is that it might be that might in your heart create disunity, the Bible says examine yourself. As we approach this table tonight, we are to each one of us, if you're a believer, is to examine yourself. You're to prepare your heart. We are not to come. Do we not, Paul says? Did he not say in 1 Corinthians that we all drink of the same cup? Do we not all eat of the same body? We must bring glory to Christ tonight by being unified together. And as we celebrate this event, this ongoing memorial, as we consider what the Lord has done for you, for me, as we consider the benefits, that ongoing the benefits of his death, burial, and resurrection, and we glorify Christ, and we humble ourselves under his word, we grow together as a body of Christ. I don't think it is any coincidence that scripture, every, when you see the Lord's Supper, you see disunity, you see division, you see unity. Right after Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, if you would turn there, 1 Corinthians 11, right after he mentions the divisions that are going on in the body of Christ at Corinth. I mean, he starts off that some are of Apollos, some are of Cephas, some are of Christ, some are Paul. The church is divided. And so he does not praise him. He mentions right before the Lord's Supper another division that was taking place, of which we're not going to talk about tonight. But he says, I can't commend you for that. But he, he mentions the Lord's Supper, the importance of taking that what that means, what it means to examine yourself. And then afterwards in 1 Corinthians 12, he begins to talk about being unified again. Remember, Jesus in verse 22, 23, said that he prays that the glory that was given to him, he would give to the, to the people who would believe on him. Ultimately, everybody has a different view on that, but it's very possible that was the Holy Spirit. Because we see in Ephesians 4 that the Spirit is the, is the unity of the Spirit. And so, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, right after the Lord's Supper, Paul once again is stressing unity. Now, one thing we are very grateful here, for here is we believe we have a unified church. That as a general rule, we are unified. But any time we come here, we have to take this for real. This is, we, the Lord's Supper is a serious matter. It's a sacred institution. And we can bring glory tonight to the Lord Jesus Christ or if we come apart, if we come with division, if you as you examine your heart know you're in unrepentant sin, if you husband and wives are not unified in the things that need to be, parents, children, maybe you're in the youth and you know that you're not unified with other youth, children, elders, any of us, we must examine ourselves so that we can celebrate what is actually here. And there's great joy and rejoicing when we can bring glory to Christ. All a Christian has to hear is bringing glory to Christ. If we can come together tonight and bring glory to Christ, it's a wonderful thing. And I think each time we, we get to do that, we do. However, it's important that we consistently examine ourselves and that, so that we bring glory to Christ tonight. So I want to encourage you to examine yourself as the men come forward. Um, I want to encourage you to be examining your heart. There are other things. You see, the, the issue is, is that when we examine our own hearts, the Holy Spirit brings to light uh, what is in our heart. It might be something completely different. But if you examine your heart and we can come and bring glory to Christ, that is something to celebrate. And that's why we're here tonight. So if our, the men would come forward, we would like to pass out uh, the elements.
thank you so much, Lord, that you gave up your life for us and that you came in the flesh and that you died on the cross and that your body was given for us. And we thank you for this bread, which we will eat in remembrance of you. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came from heaven to take our place. She was in total agreement with the Father and the Spirit to come to earth that you might go to the cross. And there you might pour out your blood that you might give up your life to pay a penalty that no one else could pay. And Lord, as we come tonight, we reflect on and are so thankful and grateful to you that you were willing to die for us. And as we celebrate this time, we, we remember, we look forward to the day that you will come again and that we will sit in the kingdom and partake of this drink in a memorial service remembering all that you have accomplished through your death on the cross. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let me just say, it is a joy to be able to proclaim that with this church.
Well, one of the marks of the church is that we practice the ordinances together, and we've already had the privilege of practicing one that is joining together in communion and by faith, joining with our Lord and also with one another. What a precious privilege that is. Well, we also have a privilege now of joining together with the Rathbuns in, in baptism. Uh, Paige and Aubrey are going to come, and Rob as well, I think, and share their testimonies with us. As they do so, rejoice with them at what the Lord has done and the joy of how he brings people to himself. So, guys, if you'll come and share your testimonies. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. My name is Paige Alexander Rathbun, I'm 14, and I've grown up in a Christian home all my life, with parents constantly teaching me God's word and encouraging me to look more like Christ. One day when I was around the age of five, I had heard about hell, and of course the first thing I thought was, wow, that's a scary place, I do not want to go there. I remember a few days later sitting down and talking with my mom and asking her, how can I get saved? So my mom went through some Bible verses with me and said a prayer. So I was pretty convinced that I was saved, but I know that I wasn't truly saved. I just did it because I didn't want to go to hell. And a few years went by, and I was about eight or nine, and my family was invited to a play that portrayed the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And it was just a big eye-opener for me, actually getting to see what Christ did for me. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, he made him who knew no sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Even though the play wasn't even close to the pain that Christ really suffered, just getting to see an example of Christ dying for me was amazing. And I started to realize that I was not really saved. I was wanting to be saved for the wrong reasons. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I never un truly understood how much God loved me or what that, the meaning of that verse was until I saw it portrayed in that play. Towards the end of the play, this guy said, if you want to talk to somebody or pray with somebody to come on down. And so I told my mom I want to go down and be saved. And so my mom took me down, and we were able to just pray and talk about it with a lady. Psalm 62, 1 through 2 says, My soul waits in silence for God only. From him is my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation my stronghold. I shall not be greatly shaken. God did one of the most amazing things that ever happened to me that night. I repented and asked God to forgive me of my sins and come into my life and cleanse me of those sins. I'm longing to look like Christ even more every day and show Christ to others. God is still working in my life every day. John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. My name is Aubrey Rathbun. I was born in New York to a wonderful mom and dad who loved the Lord. We moved from New York when I was only a little girl to come, in, to come to Tennessee. It was then that we started going to a church in Knoxville. I do not remember much about it, though. It was not long after that we started going to a different church. It was while we were attending that there that I would make a profession of faith, but really it was not true salvation. It was me saying a prayer because I wanted to be like everyone else and, go to, and not go to hell. One time, I said a prayer underneath my mania's grandmother's bed. Shortly after that, I decided to get baptized. I now realize that I was not saved and did that act for all the wrong reasons. I met with the pastor of our church and shortly after got baptized. Nothing really changed after that. I'm sure you can even ask my parents. Um, <laughs> uh, there wasn't a change of heart. I didn't have the desire to worship God, let alone be in his word. We continued to go there a while, and then some things happened with the church and we left. I did not understand all that was going on, but enough. Even though I knew we had to leave, I still did not want to leave. I mean, I had my whole life ahead of me there, my friends. Because that was the only thing that mattered, well, at least to me. Romans 8:28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good of those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. I did not love God or therefore really care about what he had to say, but only cared about what I wanted. We visited one other church before we started coming to Grace. We knew the Menards and the Lycoses were going there, so we decided to try it out. I remember and will never forget the moment I walked into the building of the church. 
The minute I walked in, a strange hyper girl um, call, um, came running up to me and dragged me into the Sunday school classroom to sit with her. This girl was Brittany O'Dell. <laughs> I, I will never forget the comfort I felt that day of so many wonderful people who loved the Lord. I don't remember exactly what it was I heard in that Sunday school or that sermon, but I know that it impacted my life. That day when I went home, I had never seen my mom and dad so happy about a church before. Seeing these changes in them had a huge impact on me. Psalm 40, verse 2. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of, my miry clay, out of the miry clay, and sat me, my feet upon the rock, making my footsteps firm. I don't have a time or date, but I know that through um, cons constant teachings of God's word, I had gotten saved. Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy, peace, and peace, and peace in believing, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It was then, then, during this time, that I realized my simple state before the Holy God and my need for Christ. I repented and asked the Lord to save me from my wretched sin, to be one of his children forever and ever, and that uh, I was called to worship him and be one of his own. In John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. It was not long after that I started to grow closer to Christ, especially during my first summer camp. From that point on, I have strived to be more like Christ and to learn and grow in his word. I started having a strong desire, desire to be in his word and actually meditate on what it had to say. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept my faith. This is something that I am now striving for in my own life. To be able to say through my faith in Jesus Christ that I have fought the good fight, and that is my forever goal as a new born-again Christian in the rest of my walk with the Lord. I was going to yell, and a lot of you that are in youth know that I can yell, um, but uh, I, I just, uh, I'll share very briefly what a, a blessing and a privilege, uh, the greatest joy as a parent to uh, have your child uh, repent and believe in Christ, see the fruits uh, of that in their lives, and uh, follow the Lord in believer's baptism. And it's a, a joy to be able to be here and to uh, be able to uh, baptize not just my daughters, but my sisters in Christ also. And I was told not to drop it in the water, so I'll set it way over here. I've been thinking a lot this last, uh, the last couple weeks of well, the fact that if we were to trace most of our ancestors, uh, if we were to go back, 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 uh, at some point they were, our ancestor lived in darkness and they had no gospel, they had no light. And what we want to do here, we've not done this before, but if you, uh, hopefully everybody has a candle and I'm going to read, I just want to read uh, again from Simeon. Uh, when Jesus was brought eight, eight, at, at eight days old, and Simeon pronounces this amazing pronouncement. And then I want, as we, what we're going to do is we're going to turn off the lights, we're going to sing some Christmas carols. The ushers are going to go down, they're going to light on the ends of the row, they're going to light the candles.
we would like then the person on the end of the road to light the next one and the next one, and so, uh, and that's how we'll do this. Uh, but the lights will be off except for probably the screen um, for the words that are on that we need to see uh, to sing. But I just, again, I want to uh, just consider the fact that Christ, we have Christ today. He's the light of the world. And uh, he has brought light and joy uh, and to a people living in darkness. And when eight days had passed before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of their, for their purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. All right, maybe if we could hit the lights. And as soon as we, as soon as we get through, the, the majority of the congregation uh, has their candles lit. We'll just we'll start singing. Translated in the 1800s, but even has its roots back in the 200s. Uh, let all mortal flesh keep silence. Please stand.
candles at some point and uh, put them, we've got some garbage cans back there, do not put those in a garbage can with a plastic bag in them, uh, please, so we have some garbage cans that do not have plastic in them. Uh, let me just thank you for coming, it's a joy to celebrate what the Lord has done with you and I pray that you have a wonderful and blessed Christmas. We have a fellowship afterwards, we have hot chocolate and coffee, please stay around a fellowship and pray that the sprinklers don't get set off. Thank you. <laughs>